Welcome to the Go Time Podcast. Go Time Podcast. With your host, Todd Martin. Today we have Jeff Henderson, the farrier. <laughs> um, so Jeff, so you're 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 now a local farrier. Yes, sir. But before, um, well, I guess you still do. You still shoe horses for Bally Doyle. Is that how you say it? Bally Doyle. Bally Doyle. Bally Doyle Racing is the um, the racing arm of the Coolmore thoroughbred empire so to speak um and i don't do work for them for bally doyle itself anymore i work for the breeding side i still travel back and forth and help with the mares oh okay that they uh, i do therapeutic work on some of the some of the special mares that would have have a little little trouble with their feet oh huh. and uh Is that's an that's a important one yeah you know keep them sound so they're gonna that's it you know mr magner that owns and his partners that own coolmore you know they have they have a deep understanding of the importance of the mares and the fact that if we don't have if we don't have mares we don't have foals and if we don't have foals we don't have race or we don't have cults right that make race horses and if we don't have those race horses we don't have stallions Mm -hmm. that's the stallion game yep that they're involved in you know and they have they have a farm there in the Hunter Valley in uh, in Australia, one yeah. in Ireland, and one in Lexington, Kentucky. So, um, I know. So for for the people that are not um, that don't know a lot about the horse deal or horses, you know, or just or they know a little bit about horses or whatever. The in the breeding thing of horses, the mares stallions are cool, and 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 but a stallion can breed a hundred plus mares in a year right. you can only read well ideally you know one physically fold. one foal a year out of a mare one foal live cover in thoroughbreds mm-hmm. right and then in the quarter horses it's still a little different so right. the quarter horses we can do embryo transfer and we can you know we can i think there's a certain number that you can keep it to but um but even in that you're limited on how many offspring you can have out of a mare and the mare makes the stud that's it I mean, the mm-hmm. mares are the most important part of of any deal. They're the top on the breeding for um, race horses, show horses, anything. It's you know the co- top quality mares. That's the that's the deciding factor mm-hmm. on on every one of those is any of your top offspring. Yeah, is your quality of mares. It's mare power. Yeah, yeah. mare power for sure. Mare, mare power. Yeah. And so yeah. that's going to be a super important job because I, that the soundness of the mare and the happy of the mare, you know, if she's feeling sure. good and doing well, the higher chances of reproduction too. That, and she'll put more into her fall. Ah, uh-huh. a mare that's True. struggling, a mare that's struggling in her feet. That's, you know, in, in later stages of laminitis or whatnot, those mares are stressed. They're, they're not putting, they're trying to put their energy into keeping themselves going. Right. And possibly don't put as much into that fall. And therefore that fall may not have, May not have as good a chance. Wow! So the better we can keep their feet, then the you know the more the more likely we are to have a successful pregnancy. Why? And how many people put that much attention to their mares? Yeah, it's it's not you know in you know I was I was fortunate enough to work there at Rudin Ridley Equine Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky, and you know that's the the epicenter of thoroughbreds in America, really, and that's where a lot of the really intense foot management practices come from because there is a, such a high level high level of of mare power there financial ability to do it and uh, and that's carried on over into Europe and everywhere else hmm. but you know a lot of a lot of people just have always thought you know we just trim them they're just old mares we'll trim them up yep. and leave them all yeah. in the field you know and if they hobble around that's just the way it is yep. but you know we've learned and and now kind of understand more about it that you know there's nothing worse than paying a big stud fee getting a mare six eight months along mm. have her slip a fall yeah and everything's lost and to find out she was 
struggling in her feet. Yeah. And, wow. And it may or may not be the cause. Yeah, yeah but, but it's something you can't control. If you paid a hundred thousand for a stud foot, mm. yeah. yeah, you know, a little pricey therapeutic shoeing isn't that yeah. big of a drop in the bucket. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's a classic sort of thing you hear about that uh, if, a, say, a mare isn't sound enough to perform herself, is just, oh, we'll make her a brood mare, but then kick her out in the back paddock and don't really pay that much attention to maybe what caused her to have to retire anyway. So it, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying is, you know, therape- ther- therapeutic shoeing to kind of keep her in the game, at least in the breeding game properly. Oh, I guess we should state that we have Brendan O'Reilly back. Oh, yeah, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Thought, you thought Todd's accent had changed. <laughs> <laughs> slipping, <laughs> slipping on my accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we kind of jumped past a little bit there. Yeah. That uh, what is it? Rudin Riddle. Rudin Riddle Equine Hospital. So, how did you get into? So, to, well, it's back all the way up. So, yeah. tell me yeah, where. How, lot, so, how did you get into it? Like, you, okay. so you're not the regular farrier no. as far as what you do. No, I w- so it all starts back. I grew up in Lubbock, Texas. I'm a, I was a horse obsessed kid. Mm-hmm. I only ever wanted to be around horses, and you know, and I just if I I always I always believed if I thought about it enough and tried hard enough, I would get to do it one day. You know, yeah. I'd get to have my own horse, and I'd get to be around horses. And so I thought about it a lot, and every day obsessed over it, and that's what I did. You know, and I followed that path. Yeah, and so it. You know, I I was lucky enough. I I decided I was going to get a degree in English literature, so I went to Sol Ross State University, and where everybody that wants a literature degree exactly, goes, yeah. exactly, <laughs> renowned, renowned, yeah. world renowned yeah. literature. But they had a shoeing school there as well, and my best friend, a uh, friend named Shane Winkler, he was involved in the shoeing program down there, and I'd go down and hang out and watch them. And one day they said, "Look, if you want to try it, give it a go." And so I did, and uh, I shot a horse, and it was horrible, and it was miserable, and it hurt a lot. <laughs> but when I finished, I had a sense of satisfaction mm-hmm. I'd never felt in my life. Yeah. And I just decided I was going to chase that feeling. Man, that's, isn't that a cool? That's deal? awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I love yeah. And so, and so, I, and I have, and I've been, I've been blessed. I'm lucky to get to do it. And I went, and from there, you know, I. <sighs> Jeez, I had so many opportunities to go, and I worked for worked for a fellow named Wayne Pfeiffer in Midland, Texas, and he he got out of shoeing horses. And now he's an ornamental iron work. He has a blacksmith huh. shop oh, over in cool. Mason, Texas, you know, and he builds chandeliers and stair railings for trophy homes. Huh. Amazing work. And I and then I got to go to I got to go up to Flower Mound and work for a fellow named Rick Garrison, and he was a bit of a he he's a very business minded fella, and he. You know, he taught me a lot about how to treat customers and how to be around mm-hmm. customers and people. Mm. And that side of it is a whole different ballgame to shoeing horses. Oh, yeah. yeah. That keeps like learning clients. How to yeah. Yeah. That's, that's as much important. And I remember he always told me, he said, if something happened to me and my family today, most of my clients would let me come stay with them if my yeah. house burned down anything because I'm that kind of a guy. Yeah. Wow. Be that kind of a guy. Yeah. And that's carried forward, you know. Yeah. That was in the formative years. Like, I started at Sol Ross in 1993, I think, and I finished up in 2000. Mm-hmm. Seven years I did that. You can get a degree in seven years. You can take some summer classes. <laughs> I was on that same track. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really good. But anyways, <laughs> anyway, so I, so, I, so I gathered, you know, I gathered momentum in the shoeing as I went along and I finished the degree and, mm-hmm. you know, I kept building, building steam. And then, uh, I went to, uh, I went to work when I got out of, when I got out of, when I got out of, out of, uh, Sol Ross, I went to work at a breeding farm mm-hmm. in college station in Granada farms. And while I was there, there were, so they're a big running quarter horse operation mm-hmm. and they have a full-time veterinarian on staff there, Dr. Neville. And there was this girl that would bring horses to get palpated for mm-hmm. her trainer that she worked for, that little breeding operation. And so I was watching her the whole time, you know, and kind of fancied her. And uh, so I, I would always make sure that I made an appearance down in the breeding shed while they, while they were there. <laughs> you knew the schedule well. Yeah, yeah. I'd see her truck pull in. And one day I was in the in the yearling barn for fitting yearlings for sale. And I told the boss, the owner, Jimmy Younger, I said, Jimmy, I said, I'm going to go down to the breeding Breeding shed, will you f- finish rinsing my horse off for me? And he said, what are you going down there for? And I said, well, 
I says, this girl, I, I kind of fancy her. I know I'm going down there and check. He says, you can, do you have a phone number? And I said, no. I said, don't come back without it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I said, don't come back. And he was serious. So I went that's down and I got her. That's a good, that's a good motivation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I went down there and I, anyways, I got her number. Called her up that evening. We started dating July 4th in 2000. And we've been together ever since. Yes. And uh, so that was cool. But so anyways, we moved to, we left there and we moved to Georgetown, up North Austin. And I built a shoe and business there. She worked at a vet, vet's office. And then she got accepted to vet school. And then, then things got a little more serious. You know? <laughs> so we moved to, anyways, we moved to College Station. She went to vet school. And I went to the woods. I shot horses and. You know, she's very busy and it was, a, you know, vet school, professional degrees are very, they have to be, it's an intense time for them. You know? Yeah. So, so I got to, I got to learn bow hunt and do stuff I like to do, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, but, a lot of alone time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she was studying and she's, yep. she's amazing. And uh, so she called me one day, we were shooting, I was driving down the road shooting horses and she said, hey, I just got accepted to an internship at Rudin Relief Wine Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. It's fantastic. That's great for you. And gee, what am I going to do now? You know, so we were married at that by that stage, and so yeah, we just packed it up and moved to Lexington for an internship. It was a one-year internship, and uh, we went up there and stayed for five years. Wow! And, uh, while we were there, Dr. Morrison, that runs the podiatry, so I went to work in the in the podiatry center at Rudin Ridley Equine Hospital. They was, there's, there was four veterinarians that shoe horses there. We had uh, Dr. Morris and Dr. Vernon Dryden, Roe Bross, and then uh, a fellow named Bob Agney as well. Anyways, these shoeing veterinarians, they work on problem wares and whatnot. And I was lucky enough to get a job with them while they were, while my wife was doing her internship. Mm-hmm. And that's, a, that's where the real stuff started to happen for me. You know, and I was able to understand more about you know, you can look at x-rays of feet and look, but when you see hundreds and hundreds, the caseload that those guys have is amazing. Mm. To be able to look at feet and then look at the x-rays and start to make a correlation of what it probably looks like inside of there yep. and start to understand and watching horses walk and watching hundreds of horses, lame horses go and seeing the way that they travel and the way, you know, you start to understand, you know, head bobs and hip hikes and different stuff that tells you how lame this is, you know, what what a lameness is and what you need to do with it. Yeah, you know, that's something that I think is like, I think, and I've, I know I've said this around a lot of other guys, is that, you know, one of the toughest things for someone who is wants to be a farrier is, you know, even for the layman that comes out, wants to go and ride, sees a horse, and they had no idea watching a horse run around that there was a lead. That a horse had mm-hmm. that it did it you know with the footfall and to see the movement on it and how long it took you to see a lead yeah. just you know oh, a right. right lead from a left lead mm-hmm. that it's a it's a learned deal that you have to you have, you have to have seen hundreds. hundreds of them you know good confirmation I say that all the time with a lot of the young kids like you know a good confirmation I can tell you all the things it's a short back it's short cannon bones it's you know this that and the other and a trapezoid and whatever else but if you don't see if you haven't seen 10 horses you really don't have a point of reference mm-hmm. for what short is right it's not that I can't tell you what that's a short back but in relationship to what mm-hmm. well if I know 100 horses at least have you know an idea but when I've seen a thousand horses, now it's even better idea. And the more and more that I start to see uh, more of the intricate parts of it, it's why it takes so long to get enough of an experience. I mean, that had to have been like a major like jump in your knowledge to get right. that much under your belt in that short amount of time. It is. It is. And, you know, the thing in, thur- in the thoroughbreds in Kentucky as well is, they're managed very heavily. The, like say the foals, we trim mm-hmm. the foals for rotational deviations. Mm-hmm. We fed lot of varus and valgus and knees and all these things, and we can we can we can manipulate a fetlock that turns in or turns out or whatever way it is mm-hmm. up until they're three months old yeah. of age. You know, we've got these windows that you can. The further up the leg you go, the 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 more time there is 
but you only have three months down yep. in the fetlock, and that's where you got to start with, you know. Hmm. And so you start watching these foals, and you know the managers at those big farms they watch the foals walk every day, and they're keeping taking notes of them because yeah. they do as they grow. Wow. You know, a lot of times what you know horses will have a tendency to toe in, yeah. And so we want to start pushing them out, yeah. But because then, as they so if a foal at three months of age is dead straight, mm-hmm. at nine or ten months of age you're in trouble. Yeah. Because he's going to hit a big growth spurt. Mm-hmm. And his chest is going to get very wide and his toes are going to start to come in yeah. and point at each other. Yeah. And you think, how did that happen? He was so straight and perfect. Yeah. Where we have to be thinking about that. And so those foals, we would trim them so that they would toe out in both fronts. Yeah. So that as that chest grows, they'll straighten up. Straightens out. up. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of that and watching it and, you know, watching foals walk. You know, we go to a big farm like like for say Lane's End Farm there, and we might what we might trim fifty or sixty foals in the morning. There'd be a big team of us, mm-hmm. but we would all there'd be three or four of us would be watching Dr. Morris and myself, possibly Rodney King when he was there, one of the other guys, and we'd all watch these foals walk and we'd talk about them. Say, mm-hmm. okay, this one we need to we need to move him a little bit, lower him on his inside or whatever to try to get him to track the way that we want for this all to to happen, mm-hmm. and. Wow. Uh, because re- realistically, you know, you want them on, you know, some some of it's for market reasons, other sure know, yeah. aesthetics. Yeah. You know, it's easier to sell straight horse than a crooked horse. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. For sure. And probably gonna stay sounder. Yeah, yeah. If he's straight, straighter than if he's crooked. Mm-hmm. You know, just the way everything lines up. So that's a big, you know. I was I was extremely lucky to get to watch all those falls and watch them and learn to watch them. But the first couple months, I would watch these falls and I'd be like, it would have to be dramatically bad for me mm-hmm. to catch it. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the guys told me, he says, "Quit looking at their knees. Quit looking at everything. You look at them from their cannonball down. Yeah, and you'll see what we're after." Huh. And it was like the light came on. Yeah. So now you know now. I've, I don't know how you guys look at horses. You probably look at horses. You look at top lines and this, this and the other. Mm-hmm. And I start at their feet and then up. Yep. You know, after I figure out, analyze all this in my mind, then I start to see you can, what it is up here. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So, so Jeff, like with the, in the thoroughbred racing industry and the breeding in particular, and they're talking about foals, like obviously it's, it's natural for them, uh, when they're younger or to, when they're born to be a little toe out naturally, right? And then they kind of straighten up as time goes ideal in the uh, ideal world. Is it, yeah. When they, when they're, you don't even try to look at them the first 10 days yeah. really. Cause they're just all over so the much tendon laxity everywhere. Yeah. And things aren't where they're going to be. So, mm-hmm. you know, once they kind of, and some of those babies need to go on box rest. Yeah. So they'll, you know, they can tighten, tighten up, up without, yeah. without running around and straining yeah. these ligaments any, any worse. So do you do you feel that like because of the money involved in the industry and the ability of of good farriers and vets to w- work on legs that it might like exacerbate genetic like maybe certain genetic defects being able to ke- continue on mm. uh, you know what I mean like r- where if you can straighten up a foal that maybe would have been pretty pretty crooked right. um no and then no one sees it say so that's a mare and then it goes on into a breeding program and so it exacerbates problems is that is that correct or it, yes that's uh so we're able to do it it comes into the old question just because we can should we mm. a bit in hmm. some instances so if i so if we have i don't feel like we're playing god too much early on, you know, helping one along. Mm-hmm. But say if if we put uh, if we do if we really make one straight sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, are they genetically just crooked? Yeah. Sometimes you'll see, you know, you might see a stallion that he's gonna throw a club foot. Mm-hmm. He's going to throw, you know, all of his babies are going to turn in or turn out or do something funny, mm-hmm. you know. But you look at him and he's straight. Yeah. Why does his babies all turn out or turn in? Yeah. yeah. Well, he possibly is straight because he had some intervention, mm-hmm. you know. But if he hadn't had that intervention, was he, would he possibly have been as successful as he was? Mm. Yeah, so. you know, and I think that, you know, I think sometimes 
you know, you look at some of that, but how many of those did you straighten that didn't go and become something? You know, I mean, yeah. straight is only one element that's of a, it, right? Yeah, and a 1%, then you get, yeah, well, then you got the heart, that, then you've yeah. got the that's the wind, then you've got the all the, and then the right environment, training environment, someone who's thinking right and, yeah. and motivates that horse in a way that, yeah. you know, is smart about it and gets the horses to desire to do it. And, you know, there's so many other things yeah. that come and then, in. And then you sometimes will get the one that does that isn't really confirmationally should be correct it. <laughs> and, it, and it can still run yeah, yeah, so exactly ab- absolutely and i saw that i saw that you know like we do like in the production breeding side we try to try to bring the best product you can to the to the sales yeah but in the end you know it's those it's those trainers with the really keen eye yeah. and the ones that, those guys that know you know that's probably not going to affect him that but you know that's not gonna i, I I've, sh- I've shot a lot of race horses and a lot of them are straight mm-hmm. and a lot of them win big races. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's not an indicator of, you know, whether they, you know, a horse isn't straight, he can't win. Yeah. That's not it at all. Right. But you try to bring, you try to have them as good as you yeah. can. Give them as a the right. best opportunity. Best you opportunity. Yeah. You can. yeah. And like you said, for long term soundness, it's probably the best. Sure. Best outlook, over time, right? over time, you know, a crooked leg will come against them. Yeah. Over yeah. time, hmm. you know, in their, performance career yeah may not yeah but over time as they get older as mares have more folds more weight cumulative yeah. effects over yeah. time you know that old bad knee at your football injury at 22 you know in your early 20s or in yeah. your teens doesn't yeah. come against you till you're in your 40s yeah and then it really starts to get you yeah so um so that had been a really cool opportunity to be able to be at a place and, and at a, a, a facility that, I mean, that's where, that's where even in medicine and everything else, where those, you know, those bigger things happen. And it's not because, you know, it couldn't happen in another situation or another place, but there's money involved. And when there's money involved in a sport where there's enough cash flow, there is actually an opportunity to, to, finance the research to get us further mm. on different deals and like the racehorse industry is one of those industries that has a lot more money in it That's than right. than any other equine industry so <clears throat> getting the opportunity to work for somebody like that or be in that environment and get to know that much more about podiatry and and that kind of stuff um how did you get into how so how did you get tied in with or, or find out about the guys that Bollywood one. So, so while I worked at while I was at Rudin Riddle, I was there for a year or so. And Dr. Morrison came in. I was getting ready for, to go to a shoeing contest, and he came back to the back r- room where the forges were, and he said, "Hey, you can go to Ireland with me tomorrow." And I said, "Excuse me, I <laughs> didn't really have that in my on my, in the cards for me." And I said, "Well, I don't know." And he said, "Well, let me know in about an hour." You know, uh, yes. so I called my wife I said hey Dr. Morrison wants me to go to Ireland I don't know about this at all like I am from out in West Texas I don't drive in Houston I don't go play, I don't go big places right <laughs> and she says go don't be stupid you know go so I said alright I'll go so I went we were going to go for two days and I had I had enough clothes for two days and I said do I need any money no you don't need money or anything I said okay so we went and we met, we met the trainer Aiden O'Brien and the veterinarian John Halley over there, and uh, so we go to the training center and look at look at piles of horses that had various problems from quarter cracks to whatever it was, and uh, so we worked with their farriers on their farrier team for a day and a half, and we met for lunch the next day, and Doctor Doctor Halley said, "Look, he said, we we haven't done enough here, so Scott, you go back to." back to Lexington and Jeff will stay and help you know our fair I thought oh I don't have any money I don't have a phone I don't have any clothes don't worry about any of that so I stayed in the hotel and they looked after me and took good care of me and uh, I stayed for another week or so and would just email my wife from the business center you know letting her know what was going on and so it came so we, we had a good good run of it there and I came back to Lexington and spent a couple of weeks and they said look they want you back and it started a cycle where we, I would spend two weeks in Lexington and one week in, in Ireland working for them. The horses are shot every twenty-one days yeah. on the racing, on the racing side. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, we did it. I did it for three years, flying back and forth. And wow. uh, during that time, you know, my wife and I were thinking longer term, wanting you know have kids and all that stuff, and so it it got really tough. And uh, the Irish guys offered me a job, and I said, "Look, you know, we'd like for you to come over and just be part of the team." And it was at a good time for us. We'd been at Rig Riddle for five years. Mm-hmm. You know, my wife needed a break. And it was a, it was a great chance for us to go. And so we we just you know didn't want to have any regrets and wonder what would happen if we ever went. You know, what would have happened if we went yeah. to Ireland? So yeah. we just did it. Yeah, you know, nice. we loaded up and did it, and uh, moved over there and had two beautiful children while we were there. Oh yeah, and uh, so they got the uh, they got the Irish passport and the, the and the U.S. passport. Or so my little fella Cormac, he has his Irish passport, but we would have had to live there for three years prior to the birth of of the first one. Claire okay. was born shortly yep. after we arrived. Mm-hmm. We moved over there pregnant, and uh, so she doesn't have her she doesn't have her Irish passport. She was eligible for it, mm-hmm. but. We were all actually eligible for Irish passports oh, because wow. we'd been there so long. For so long, yeah, and nice. uh, we started the paperwork, and then COVID hit, and everything turned upside oh, down. So you've only like fairly recently come back. We moved back, moved here in January. Wow, January wow. this year. Wow. So one question I have that I thought of before before I forget, and uh, it's probably more like early on it's to- when you were telling your story about early on when you were kind of moving and stuff. Not so much now because of what you've done and the name you have but uh was it hard when you sort of were moving and and your wife was studying to you'd end up in a new place and have to sort of start the business again so to speak um or did you always kind of know someone to start working for where you got there i i've generally had pretty good idea the guys around you know i'm a you know i was always involved in you know our state farrier association Mm -hmm which I haven't really gotten involved in since I've been back because I'm Mr. Mom and I don't have as quite as much time to get involved and all that. But there's a great resources amongst the American Farriers Association and the Texas Professional Farriers Association. Mm-hmm. And there's always those guys you can call them up and say, hey, you know, I don't. I believe that if you're not busy, you need to be working, mm-hmm. whether it's building horseshoes. Yeah. If I, like if I arrive here and I don't have anything to do today, I'm gonna call some. I'm gonna call a farrier that I can find. Yeah. Say, hey, I'm gonna get in the truck with you and go. You know, mm-hmm. you don't have to pay me. Don't buy me. I'll buy my own lunch. Whatever. Just go and meet those guys because most successful farriers that I've found have some clients that don't really fit in their business model anymore. Yep. And they'd like to get rid of them, but they they're good people, but they don't want to just throw them to the wolves. Yep. They don't want to treat them poorly, quit showing up, quit returning phone calls. Mm-hmm. But if there's a young and up and coming guy Making that they can say, them. Hey, I've got a guy that's going to take good care of your horses. Then they can feel good about passing those horses on. Mm-hmm. The client feels good about, about that. You know, every client, you know, I, I find most of the clients understand that, you know, they've got one horse and here you have, you've grown in your business and your abilities to where you can start working for guys like Todd who have a bigger barn. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, business sense says that that's the kind of work you need to be doing. So you've outgrown this client. Yeah. Nothing wrong with this client. Good pay, good horse, but it doesn't fit your deal anymore. Yeah. So yep. it's important. But if you don't know a bunch of other, you know, hmm. if you don't put yourself out there, then those farriers don't know to give don't know you're there to give those horses to. Yeah. And you can build it, you build a business, the first twenty horses are the hardest. Yeah. Once you got twenty horses, you're flying. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Each of those people tells two or three of the people. Mm-hmm. You know, never, I've never put a business card in the feed store. Never done any of that stuff because it doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, it works, but you know, like yeah. you're gonna get the horses that nobody wants. To yeah. Get. You've gotten the one that everybody's passed off yeah. and said, That's "I it. don't want. I don't care." That's it. You know, yeah. and I've always been very. I've always been good about talking to people mm-hmm. you know putting myself out there never being afraid to just walk up to a farrier and like all along anywhere i ever went if i was on vacation with my family i'd find a farrier somewhere and go spend an afternoon go eat lunch with somebody mm-hmm. you know and those guys the more that you do then they go you know and then like i might say hey i've got a good guy here and i'll call one of my friends that has a business that's too full you know mm-hmm. i see one of my friends that's shooing horses too late at night and he's he doesn't need to be doing that i say mm-hmm. hey I got a kid who'll take some of that work mm. and they can pass them on. And that's where, that's where it really grows and builds. 
but you have to do good work too. Yeah. Like that's it. But you don't get, you know, developing, like I'm 23, I think 23 years shooting horses. Mm-hmm. They're like, I didn't get good at it for a long time. Yeah. It sucks. Yeah. Like getting good at it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and one of my, one of, I remember I nearly quit early on, like the first year or so. And one of the guys, I forget who he was, told me, he said, he said, you just have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah, I love that saying. I love that saying. And once I, once I realized that, I was like, oh, because I kept waiting for it to get comfortable. Yeah. I kept thinking, this is this just sucks. Yeah. Like, yeah. This is never going to feel good to me. And I realized, it's not. No. Yeah. God, it's and not. that word, that translates to everything. Yeah. Everything worth but pursuing. It, you exactly. Know? Yeah, but if you, if you be uncomfortable for a little bit, you're going to make the horse comfortable. Yeah. And then he's going to quit pulling on you. Yeah. And he's going to quit yanking and pushing and yeah. leaning. And yeah. So you sacrifice a little of you to yeah. give to him. And then all of a sudden, shooting horses isn't that hard. Yeah. That's what a, a good guy that I started with like early said that. He's like, it's not it's not their job, like the horse's job to to make to get in position for you. It's your job to get in position to make them comfortable and it'll make it quicker and easier, you know? Yeah. And it's not his idea. None of this yeah. we do yeah. is his idea. <laughs> like he's letting us do this. Yeah. yeah. So we better better make it easy for him. Yeah. He's driving the bus. Yeah. You <laughs> know, he really kinda is. So yeah, you know, I think, you know, building shoeing businesses is is hard work, but it's it's rewarding. Yeah. It's good to see you know, and I have a, you know, there's a certain type of horse that I tend to like to work on. Like, I've always been a, I've always been drawn more towards the sport horses, the jumping horses, dressage horses. That's what the, the lion's share of my business is today. I was never a, a racehorse guy. Mm-hmm. It just, you know, my life led us down that road yeah. and yeah. it worked great for us, you know. I had an amazing job where, you know, my wife didn't have to work for seven years. And that's priceless. Yeah. When your wife can stay home with the kids, that's mm. priceless. Yeah, that is. You know, yeah. now she's, you know, she's a full-time ambulatory vet over at Ratom Equine Hospital. And that's not the case anymore. Yeah. You know? yeah. I get to do it. But, like, just building that business and, but that's not what I was <laughs> But now my my focus is more to those sport horses. Yeah, their you know goals are different for the clients, different for you know. There's not the pressure now that I experienced in the racing. Yes. You know, yeah. It's a different. It's a different type of people. A different type of horse. They're tall. They suit my. They suit my body style. Mm-hmm. They're supple. You know, and I think if a guy wants to, I want. I'm 48 years old. I want to shoot horses when I'm 60. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the only way I'm going to do that is if I find horses that suit my body style. Yeah. Hmm. And if I... I never st- thought of that. And if I stay fit... Mm, that's smart. Yeah. If I stay strong and fit... Yeah. I'll get there. Huh. I'm not going to be shooting six or ten a day. Yeah. At 60. But I'd still like to be able to shoot three or four a day and carry on that way. And you'll do it because those... You know, I learned that working with thoroughbreds. Is they're tall and they're supple. Just the geometry of a horse. When you pick up his leg and he's 16 hands, there's more length in each of that each segment of bone there. The more length allows you to get that leg further mm-hmm. out away from their body, thus mm-hmm. giving you more room. Guys with wider shoulders, taller guys need that room to be comfortable and not be in as big of not be as uncomfortable. Yeah. When they're doing the job, that's why it's, I'm always so damn uncomfortable yeah. trying to do, Dude, <laughs> do mine. The, wor- the worst <laughs> for ones, me, the worst ones are that they're not like they're not a tiny pony that you can like one hand it. Yeah, but they're also not tall enough to get under there. It's like you got to. It's the oh worst. my god! It's like yeah. You're in like that's a. That's why I always squat. felt like my I that was having to contort my knees. Like. Yeah, yeah. Well, that one time I had I was doing one. Uh, that Luca was helping me with. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I finished with two feet, and I was, like, about out of breath and sweating like crazy. I was like, man, I'm going to finish through tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that was hard. Yeah, And, you know, like, different types of horses, like halter horses. Oh, I find yeah. them, I find them very difficult to work on. They don't have much flexibility. They're, you know, just like a big bodybuilder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know, they can't. 
they don't have much mobility. Yeah, yeah. Neither do those big kind of horses. Huh, never yeah. thought of that. So yeah. that's kind of what I, that's kind of where my practice is going. Smart. And uh, yeah, like I enjoyed the racehorse stuff. You know, it was cool to do. It was really cool to do. You know, but but I've always. You know, when I started out, that's the kind of horses that I got to work on was the jumpers and the dressage horses and the kind of the English sport horses. Mm. And I like I like that, you know, I like that type of horse. Mm. I like horses that work for a living, that do yeah. something. Yeah. You know, a lot of guys go, oh, you know, why do you like to mess with them with dressage horses? Well, they do something. Yeah. Like if you ever watch any high level dressage, it's, it's oh. fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know, yeah. those riders understand where the feet are. They, yeah. They're moving, they're moving a horse they're moving different parts of that horse all the time. Like yeah. a lot of people are just reacting to what's going on. They're oh, sitting yeah. up there and the horses are galloping along. They don't know what lead they're on. They don't understand any of that stuff. They're just going along for the ride, you know. Mm-hmm. Those girls can really tell what's going on. You know, this horse is doing this at this. They probably don't. Yeah. And that's cool. You know, I find that I find that fascinating. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and yeah. I appreciate I appreciate things that work, people that work, mm-hmm. dogs that work. I like yeah. all that, you know. Yeah. And that's kind of where. So when you, um, so being over there with those guys for that amount of time, how um, how closely did you work with the trainer? So so Aiden O'Brien, the trainer for for them, uh, we would, we'd speak nearly every day. Oh, wow. And uh, so basically my job is I was, I was a head farrier for the training center. There's, about 250 horses there and um wow. so there's there's a couple other fellows that, that worked for me while i was there that they didn't work for me they worked with me you know i led yeah. the t- i led the team they did most of the heavy lifting right i shot yeah. race horses till lunchtime every day and then i went and shot mares in the afternoon yeah. So like plating, you were plating in the morning and plating then race maybe horses. corrective stuff yeah and then i go and then i go see mares in the afternoon okay and, uh, but no, Aiden O'Brien's an incredible man. He's a genius when it comes to training horses. He can yeah. see things that you'd never, you know, I remember the very first horse I saw came out of box one in the, the old yard there. And his name was Kate Blanco and he struggled. He had an awkward way of going and hmm. we, uh, we were able to help his feet out and he got a bit sounder and a little better. And he went on to win some big races mm. for him, you know, and, and it was cool to have a hand in that. But, uh, but Aiden was able to see, you know, a lot of places would say, you know, nah, that horse may not gonna make it, you know, but he's able to see the potential in them yeah. and, uh, and no, and he's able to, he, he's able to say, okay, we need to get some people that can fix, you know, that yeah. can help sort this out. And mm. then. We can so he knew how to like build a team around a horse too. Huh? Unbelievable team builder. Yeah, huh. that's he's cool. he's really he's really impressive man. I I enjoyed working for him. He's he's demanding. He's you know his attention to detail is second to none. He spot he spot a yeah. little black tick on a black horse a mile away. He hmm. understands everything. He's so involved. He doesn't miss. He doesn't miss anything. He knows everyone that works for him. There's hundreds of people there. Really? So, so how much scope with like that horse was still racing at the time you were you were talking about when you're like plating one? How much scope do you have to be correcting uh, problems while it's racing, or do you have to like spell them for a little while to get to get? You know, you don't that? have much time. You don't have much. You know, like say if a horse pops a quarter crack, mm. he probably gonna gallop tomorrow. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you need to be able to help him do it. Yeah. You know, he could be lame today, but he needs to be, you know, and so we're able to learn some techniques and some ways to keep horses going. You know, their, you know, their, their pathway is mapped out early on. Mm-hmm. You know, if a cult is bred a certain way and he's steered towards these certain races because we'd like to see him become a stallion. Mm-hmm. So he needs to be, he needs to be in the English guineas race. He needs yeah. to be in the Epsom Derby. He needs to go to all these races, these uh-huh. big races to fulfill his obligations to become a, a stallion. Yeah. And so there's not a lot of days off in that program. Yeah. Well, you can't have a farrier that's too concerned about too many other things besides the importance of that whole yeah. deal. I mean, you, you would have to have a crew like that in order to do it. And somebody, so I, I, I'm curious on the trainer end of, of it. So how did you notice 
how much he put into or concerned himself with the um, with the the personality of each one of them, and how that came into play too. The personality of the horses. Yeah. Yeah, he would know. You know, he watches these he watches these cults come up. And he he would be able to go over and look at look at them as foals a lot of times and as yearlings, and he would track these horses and know these bloodlines. Yeah. Because the great thing about that place is that, so it's a basically a closed, I don't know, closed gene pool, not so much, but so they breed most of their own horses, mm-hmm. and so you'd have these certain breedings that would come each year. Mm-hmm. So you know that this mare. This particular mare, her cults tend to be a bit more headstrong, yep. a bit more willing, or you know. So, I think that helps him a lot too. Is he yeah. know the families. When you know the families, you know how to get in their yeah. heads a bit more. Oh, it makes a big difference. And then you'd have, and then so there's over 50, 50 riders there on staff wow. every day. Yeah, and the horses go out in groups of 50, 60 horses, and so he knows which riders to put on which oh, horses cool. so he can tailor the whole thing to suit yeah you know, it's amazing Man, he unbelievable showed a, he showed me a video of him like galloping <laughs> like 50 of them yeah. coming yeah. running through Whoa, he no. talk about cool man yeah that was really cool because they've got a big uh a big stable in australia right mm. the same the same place yes, yeah yes, yeah they're I I know I'm pretty sure Aiden O'Brien brings horses to the Melbourne Cup yes. every year. Yes, Aiden and his son Joseph also mm-hmm. bring horses. They have had a lot of a lot of success down there. Yeah, with their horses. Yeah, it's it's great. Um, it's very global. You know, I I've, I'm blessed. I've been able to go travel the world with them. You know, so Australia is one of the only places I haven't got to go. Oh, his man. son was his son, his was, son was a champ. jockey, right? Yeah, his all of his son all of his children have been jockeys. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it's a yeah. whole it's a whole family affair. Um, his, you know, Aiden met his wife, and she was she was champion jockey. I think she was champion jockey in Ireland. Was Aiden wow. a jockey? Mm-hmm. Okay. Aiden started out as a jockey, so he knows it from like the ground. I think ground up. He, he I think got that's on a, a horse. He got on a horse at Breeders' Cup a few years. It was probably ten years ago. Something wasn't. Something didn't suit him about the yeah. way the horse was being ridden, and he pulled his pulled the rider off, and he hopped on. He gave it. Really. He, he put it through its paces. Wow. Ah. He's still, he's still got it. He's still got it. That's, yeah. that's, he's amazing. And like, he wouldn't ask you to do anything that he can't do. Yeah. You know, hmm. I think as a, as a leader in any, uh, like a leader or a manager in any capacity, it's such an advantage to know the job from the ground up. And Absolutely. he truly does, you Absolutely. know, like he, so that's, he, he gets it. Well, yeah, that's been really lucky for you. I mean, lucky, good. I mean, just being willing to step into uh, like that higher quality and that realm right of working with and, and around those kind of people it inspires you to to work yourself to a different yeah. level too right yeah being held to a very high standard yeah you know and when you're in that environment you're being held to a very high standard by him and then you hold everyone around you to a high standard and it's a, it's a whole series of checks and balances you know mm. and honesty and integrity is massive there you know one of the first things that you know i was told when i came on you know doesn't matter what happens. It always has to be. It's about the horses, and so we will always speak openly and honest about them. Mm-hmm. We're all grown ups here. We're all over twenty one. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, it's not about personalities. You know, we have to do what's best for the horses here. And if you, see, you know, if something's happening that shouldn't be happening, it needs to be brought out so it can be dealt with properly. God, yeah. and that be a great. I mean, but in that great deal, right? Yeah, not, it, don't pull any punches. Don't any, like yeah. we're all adults here. We're do your job, much. and let's say what's gonna needs to be said. And if you're doing everything you can, that's all there is to be done. Yeah, and and everybody can accept it. Things are gonna go wrong. You have 250 horses. Stuff's gonna go wrong. Yeah, and you have 250 horses going as fast as they go. Things can go real <laughs> fast. Things can go wrong. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah. And. But if we were all doing the best we could, then that's just the way it is. It happens. Yeah. You know, it's the, it's just the way it happens. But, you know, you have to you have to cover all the bases, you know, and be thinking all the time about that stuff. And it, it was great. And it's unbelievable to work for. It's unbelievable to work in that environment because you're not limited by, 
you know, now you say, oh, you know, this horse would probably be better if we put a pair of pads or we did this, mm. you know, but that's going to be an extra $7,500, you know. Yeah. Can your finances, can you, can you handle that? Well, <laughs> probably not this time around. Okay, so we're not working at our optimum level mm. because there's something we could have done that might make your horse better, but well, we your budget it. doesn't allow it. Right. right. So we just have to carry on like we are, and we're probably going to keep having the same yeah. problem. Yeah. But in that environment, that doesn't matter, you know. It's, it's what's best for them. Boy, that is a cool environment to be working yeah. in, too. Yeah, you know, and, like, no, there's nobody asks the question, you know. Wait, hold and on. And the last thing, you know, and, the, like, they don't want to hear, oh, well, I would have done that, but I was afraid that would come. No. That yeah. That's not the deal. Boy, that makes it. It was one of the lucky things that I had earlier on whenever I had, I stepped into having a client that was willing to spend and go on, you know, some really nice horses. And it was like, there was never a question of, of, you know, what can we do is do the right thing. Yeah. And it was never, uh, you know, well, you know, do, do we, you know, trying to, trying to run on, you know, a little thinner line or whatever. Yeah. It was just, man, just, if we need to wait, we wait. If we need to do it, we do it. But, you know, um, it allowed me as a, as a, as a competitor to be able to go, you know, so we just got to do this. And I got to, when I went to show or compete, I didn't, um, I didn't show with inhibitions because I wasn't, um, I wasn't going in there worried about what the next, how it was going to affect the next, next run or what, you know, what might cause this to happen on the other. It was just like everything was taken care of and you just go and, you know, yeah. Let it go with, with it. you know, like a sit and worry about and like, go, go yeah. run, go run hard and see what happens. Let's go. Because you, you, you can do it with confidence knowing that you've done all you can do. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Not thinking, oh, if we would have done this, this might have gone better. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Just go on with it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a really special experience to get to be involved in all that and, you know, meet, meet Aiden every day on the road and, you know, how's everything going? Good. Okay. Thanks. You know, like you don't, like that man has a lot going on. He's managing all those people, all those horses. He watches everyone. You know, he goes and he watches every horse gallop down the gallop. And he he talks to everybody, you know. And he trusts me with that. He yep. trusted me with the foot care. And that's my department. Hmm. And so I knew I didn't have to call him and ask him about it. Permission. I didn't have to tell him everything that happened, yeah. you know. But he trusted me that I was taking care of that, you know. Mm -hmm. And that, so, and that's the way that those deals kind of work is, you know, he puts the best people in the best places and then, you know, then you can come to him if you, something's really a problem, Yeah. you know, and ask him what you think, or this is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. You do that. And, uh, so it was, it was really cool. And, you know, you see him every day. He, 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 he walk around every afternoon and visit with everybody and go around to the yards and anybody from the stall cleaner, you know, grooms, everybody, he knows their names and he, you know, Brendan, how's your family? You know, what about your kids? What age is this one? What school is this one going to? You know, mm. unbelievable. And you really feel invested in, in that environment. Cause it's a hard, it's hard, you know, Boy. it's hard when you're in there at six 30 every morning, yeah. and, you know, the racing season's long and doing all that stuff, you know, but when, when you're, when the guy at the very top of it yep. knows your kids and know and talks to you and you know, you always feel good walking away from it. Like that's yeah. that's important. I always felt that was really important to me. Yep. Like you're contributing to something big. You're and and like Aiden always says, he says, Look, you know, we're all just a cog in the wheel. We're a link in this big chain, yeah. you know. We're all pulling together, you know. Nobody's any more important yeah. than, than anybody else here. Yeah. Oh, and we all hear yeah. that, but there's so few that really. Yeah, know, but he really believes it, way. and you know, like you see him on the you see him on the interviews after winning, you know, after yeah. winning the Epsom Derby, after winning these big massive races, and he always thanks you know the lads that ride the horses, the the guy that runs the yard, you know. And yeah, it, it's it's a it's it's a bit special, you know. That is that is that's mm. that's because a lot of times leadership. you see you know it, me 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and it teaches you when you work in that environment, it teaches you to keep your me, me, me to yourself a bit too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know? And you learn, wow, you know, that, you know, 
I should give credit to everybody else that helped me along the way. It's not yeah. about me today. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah, but you know, and that, that you good. see that always starts at the top. Mm. That the always culture. starts. Yeah, the yeah, culture is culture. always, it, but it's always, it's inspired from the top, right? You don't see somebody, you know, going me, 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 and then all the others down below are being humble and, and you know, you know, like you don't see that. No. Um, you see that's always done, if it's done and done well, it's done from the top down. Yeah. 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 It takes a special individual to be, and I would imagine like it's even more so being in that position and doing well for an extended period of time. Yeah. You know, the longer you're in that environment, yeah. the more you expect it or you just kind of take for granted some of that stuff. But to be know. that... It would be an inten- I guess I'm saying it's it's intentional, yeah, right? Yeah. Like you would you you can't stay yeah. at that point and not yeah. be intentional. You no, know, you don't stay at that the, level. The king doesn't stay on the throne without yeah yeah you know, without keeping it. Yeah, and he's been on the throne a long he time. Has. And that's the thing you hear about certain trainers. They'll come out and win a, a big race, and then that's it. Or you might hit you know. Whereas he he he's a guy it's you you hear of him every big race in multiple countries he's in, and he has been for years. So hmm. yeah, we were you know. At, Especially in 2017, he broke the world record, won 28 grade one races in one season. Oh. Unbelievable, unbelievable season. Yeah. You know, and to, but to consistently wow. win from between 10 and 20 every year, you yeah. know, and but to and he knows that if you don't keep pushing and don't keep driving hard, mm. it'll all you know. There's yeah. somebody hungry coming along the that's, way. yeah you know yeah. the intensity that the man has to stay at it and stay so focused because it's easy it's easy when you get when you have a bit of success to go, all right i'm pretty comfortable here. yeah i'm gonna coast along i'm doing enough you know everybody's paying the bills everything's going good and then all of a sudden you know you're not there anymore you lose yeah. a bit of relevance yeah he, he's he's unreal that way he's still going and he's done everything well i wonder you know on a on a guy like well, now we're the whole interview is not about uh, about you it's about <laughs> but, but those guys are in, inspiring right I I something else that I noticed about him too right is um, that he uh, he had uh, he brought his family into his business right I mean like so that's so it's one thing to be you know king and doing that but watching the rest of everything else you got go to pot yeah. right because you're you're not spending time with your family i mean that's that's an all encompassing you know deal if you're living right. it right and it's the same thing as like when you go to a certain level um you're going to and i would imagine like you've done that too that you know you at the time when your wife went to to the big hospital up there and started that you went along and supported that Absolutely. then when she gets that you got that part then she took that supportive role Absolutely. too and like there's a balance to all of that and then so to see that his his kids come up and were a part of the business that that you get them into it um you know that's that's pretty cool because if not then your family falls apart too and then once that falls apart who gives a crap about your business yeah. or you just care about your business and don't care about the other mm. that's it and and to bring it all back to family as well you know when we're all not here anymore mm. it's not gonna matter what horse we took to the big show yeah. Oh, yeah nobody cares no no it's not gonna matter how many grade one winners mm-hmm. how many english derby winners i shot how many any of that stuff doesn't matter what matters is those kids and how much time i was with them yes because mm-hmm. that's your only true legacy yeah they remember did I come home or was I doing something else yeah that's yeah. all that matters the rest yeah. of this doesn't matter yeah. and like the horses are extremely important but that was always that was always one of the things that Aiden always would say to he said look you know in the end they're just horses you know it's you know they get us where we need to go but it's perspective but we you know but our family is where it's at you know and it's important yeah I, mm. you know I really believe it and I'm I'm lucky you know to get to I've done what I got to do and see, you know, but like I was home most every night. Yeah. In our, you know, mm. we would fly the horses to England to race, but be home that night. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we'd leave at four thirty in the morning, put the horses on an airplane, fly them to England, race, come home, be back at home that night. Yeah. You know, wow. like there was times, you know, say like we go to Dubai for the world cup and we'd be gone for a week. You know, I wouldn't get to spend, 
be with the family then or in yeah. Saudi or wherever we were at, you know, but, uh, to be home with your kids, with your family, you know, it's unreal. And yeah. if you couldn't be with them, you know, like. That had to have been funny just seeing the kid from Lubbock cruising around Dubai at <laughs> Saudi. Loading <laughs> horses on a plane. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's unreal, like, to, <laughs> to think that where I came from and what I got, you know. The thing is that. I don't have anybody in my family, you know, I have uncles and cousins that team rope and stuff up in Utah and whatnot, but. Like, there's no more shirts in my family. Yeah. And to think that, I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> I just decided I was doing it. That's so it. cool. I, one of my favorite, like, if I'm feeling a bit like, oh, you know, like, I feel like I'm not making progress in something, I think yeah. there's this one, one quote is like, remember the times or remember the time when all you wanted was what you have now. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, yeah. like, look back, say, yeah. 10 or 15 years ago where the only thing that you could have hoped for is exactly the life you have have now you know and it's like man be grateful for what you have now that's mm-hmm. you know it, it is it is and i think i think complacency is is bad mm. and like i've always i've always thought about like today's great but five years from now where are we gonna be yeah mm. what's gonna happen to us where are we you know i always want to look at that picture mm-hmm because the days are short, you know, the, the days are long, the years are short, mm-hmm. especially, you know, with kids and stuff too. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's like perspective is something that, you know, I've been trying to get a lot more of on stuff. I, like I, I, you know, I heard it said once before about like the process of, of, um, the process of sanctification, right. The, the, to, you know, kind of getting better and at, at what you're doing right and things that are important and if i look and see where my progress is at in the past you know like six eight months i'm like god i'm never gonna get there like oh my god you know i'm struggling i'm struggling right now and <laughs> in my purple belt <laughs> you know but I'm, you know you find something that you're struggling in and you look at it but if you take some perspective step back and go where was i at in in my progress from 5 years ago to now mm. like it's a light years difference mm. on how much i've grown or whatever i'm doing and whatever else and and if you don't or, or you know and heading towards where i want to be in 5 years from now yeah. like i'm 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 on track i might in the past yeah. 4 months might have been a struggle but it's those are the things that bro- break most people or make most people stop yeah. is seeing what the, where they're at and what they're not right, getting right, done yeah. in the past six eight months and it was just the knowledge of knowing what would happen if i persevered yeah. for an you know i say that to my, my non-pros they're like what's the difference you know when you're training and when you stop is like I just realized that if I keep doing it, it's going to change. Mm. And you, you didn't realize that if you had stuck with, with holding that horse in that position for f- just two more minutes, it would have all been worked out. But you quit early. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's having that perspective and realizing that there's going to be a good, you know, as it goes, comes sure. along, you know, sure. and not stopping there and wallering and, and then getting caught up in your, you know, no, I'm never going to get there, you know, kind of deal. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, a friend of mine, Brian Osborne, he, he's a farrier up in Kentucky, and he always said, he helped me get my, he helped me when I got my certified journeyman farrier certification, and I was, there was something I was struggling with, making bar shoes or something. He said, he said Jeff, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> he said, one bite at a time. Hmm. One bite at a time. That's how you're going to build this bar shoe. Start with the little things. Get to where you do these little things really good. Mm-hmm. And then it'll all start to fall in place, you know. And that's 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 it. You can't look at the big elephant. Yeah. Just it's look at what's like on your plate at, today. Looking at the leg and starting yeah. at the yeah, very just, bottom. Just, get, huh. just do what you can do and get on with it. You know, but you will get there, you know. I think that's, I think it's pretty important to, to uh, you know, and... And like I've got a, a friend of mine named Scott Shields. He's a he's a bit and sperm maker now. And uh, check him out. He uh, they told me one time. He said he said man he said Flacco, you're lucky. You you get to shoot horses. <laughs> you have the ability, and it's you're you're good at it, and it you like doing it. Mm-hmm. You know. He's like you're one of the lucky ones, and you know to get to do something you love every day. Yeah. Man. What a gift. It's crazy, right? I, I, and once you figure out how to do it to where 
make good money. You make a good living at it. Mm-hmm. And it's it's true with everybody. When you're being compensated well, you can do a lot of stuff that you don't really love doing. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. you can you can like it more. You can yeah. you know. But you know, I I just it's a lot easier to stay focused when you're not worrying about that. You know. And, play, and you know, Todd, you and I have talked about placing value on yourself and you know your skills and growing your skills so that you know you can make a decent, good living for yourself and mm-hmm. not have to do you know because like I'm in, I'm in a position where I, I get to be Mr. Mom with these kids, so I have a window during the day that I can shoot horses and I need to maximize that time and get the most out of it, you know. So the, you know. You try to put yourself in a spot where you can do high value things, and you know, and then my exp- my time with those kids is high value. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, you know. I you know that's what I sat down one and talked to. We I think you were there whenever I did it with Luca, mm-hmm. when he was you know trying to figure out his pricing and stuff. Oh and, yeah, and you know I just wrote out and like he's doing ten head a day, you know, and he's you know I was like if you just. If your profit was a hundred dollars per head, and you're you know working yourself and you've got so many people, that's not like don't try and do all of those others and start doing fifteen head a day. You know why don't you go and charge ten dollars more and you eliminate one that you have to do a day, and then you get to you don't neglect the rest of your family and your your time spent spent on building other shoes or doing whatever else it is that you're doing, but. No one is gonna pay you more without asking. That's it. You know, they're, they're, if mm-hmm. I, you know, if you don't value your time, no one else will. No. You have to value your time. You have to. No one knows how to treat you unless you tell them. That's it. And you train them to train them to value. I value your time, and you value mine. Exactly. Yes. It's a trade off. And I, I see it in I see it in our industry a lot, and it's a it's a failure. I don't know if it's a failure on our lack of business sense because business isn't really taught to us. And I'm not a great businessman either, but I do understand people a good bit, and I understand that if I'm going to Todd's house to shoot three head, and he's got other stuff he needs to do today, and if I'm gonna be five minutes late, he's gonna get a text. Mm-hmm. Todd, I'm running five minutes behind. The little yeah. fella didn't want to get dressed this morning. Whatever it is, sure, you know. And then my people can set their clocks by by what I do. Yeah. And when I get done shooting your horse today, I write you out an appointment on the bottom of your invoice and say, I'm going to be back at this time on this day, five weeks from now. And I'm going to be there. And that's what I owe to you. And that's what I owe to those horses as well, is to, to manage it so that I'm running it and it's not running me. That is true, right? And You're managing so, it, and it's not managing you. That makes a big difference. That's it. And then I know, I opened my book up today, and I looked. I know what I'm doing five weeks from today, because yep. I wrote it down today. I should repeat today in five weeks. Yeah. That's the way my business runs. Who that that you mentioned one guy that you what was in the Midland that you were working for that taught you a lot more of the business end of, of it? The fella in uh Flower Mound, Flower Mound. Garrison. Yeah. Yeah. And he was he was strict about that stuff too. You know, make appointments, keep them. And and just as soon as I can make an appointment, I can also make myself a day off. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Jeez, that's the hard one. So yeah. so if you if you look in your <laughs> Brendan doesn't take a day. If you look at if you look at your book, okay, five weeks from today I'm shooting these horses. And five weeks from today, I'm gonna write that Friday off. Yeah. And I'm just yeah. not gonna put anything in there. That's smart. And I'm not gonna because it's that far out, you can do that. Yeah, you know? and you schedule around it, you know. And and I think people aren't good enough about doing that. I'm not good enough about doing it to myself, but it's it's a goal I work towards. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's you know? that's smart too. And I think that's you mentioned something sort of similar about longevity a little earlier. But I think a lot of guys with horseshoeing don't look at maybe the longevity, so they try and do as much as they can for as long as they can, and then run their body down and don't take days off and that sort of thing and you were mentioning that you're trying to play a bit of a you're selecting the horses that allow you to suit suit, that suit you and i think that's that that and like business sense are things that it's part of the being a professional like farrier that no one that you don't think about Mm -hmm. people think about shoeing horses but you don't think about business management and dealing with 
dealing with people and also like or it's you're almost an athlete like managing injuries oh, yeah. and, and that sort yeah. of thing you have a shelf life yeah. in this game but you can manage your shelf life a bit yep and it just you takes effort right I yeah mean, you, you got to you don't you don't just have to be reactive to your circumstance mm-hmm. I think you you know the only person in charge of me is me yeah and so I need to pick pick and choose what I do and make it make it just as advantageous as I can every mm-hmm. Every, every step of it, you know, and, and part of business too, guys, I, I always try to, when I talk to guys, young guys shooting horses and stuff is if you want to get to, if you want to get to shoot those good horses mm-hmm. and you want to work for those people that have good horses and have the, the resources, you need to look like somebody that they want to have working for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that's a, that's a, that's a, I don't know if it's a character flaw in our industry because like horseshoers as a whole don't like to be told what to do don't like you know there's a lot of stuff (laughs) you know we're pretty a different kind of a breed you know Mm. people don't choose horseshoe and horseshoe intends to choose us and but you know i believe a collared shirt is the minimum when you work for you know a certain group of folks that you want to work for you know i spend an extra ten dollars a month to have my truck where I can drive it through a car wash and I don't yep. have to wash it. Yep. But I generally pull up my clean truck and I open my truck up and it's clean and organized. You know, that stuff matters to those people. If you go around to a lot of a lot of people who have a lot of resources and you go to their house and you see their things and how they keep mm-hmm. their things, there's a pattern. And we need to try to follow those patterns if we want to be that. Mm-hmm. The dream is free. Yeah. You know, like... Just, we, but we got to pay attention to what this is what it looks like. Yeah. And, and you know what? They notice that, like, you're going to see that and they're going to notice it, whether it's a 2021 20, Ford truck or if it's a 1978 Ford truck. If that 1978 Ford truck comes up and it sounds good and it's clean and it's taken care of and it is sharply done it doesn't matter it's mm. it i think that's something that a lot of the young ones look at and go you know well, i've got to have i need to have that you know for the horse trainer it's the brand new truck and the monster trailer right i've got to have that that trailer you can have that i can't i'm not a steel trailer i'd have you know a big aluminum trailer that i got you know spend about one hundred fifty thousand dollars on and now i gotta ride 10 extra horses and whatever else and in reality, if you just have a trailer that is clean, well taken care of, that you put the time and the effort into, it's the same thing. Yeah. I mean, they that's what they see, not the year model of what it is, mm-hmm. but the quality that you and the time that you put into that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the same with my facility. And I've I, I need uh, I need to step up on mine. Like I I need more landscaping. That's what I'm waiting until my boys are big enough where they can yeah, start doing get more. Some free <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I mean, if you take the time and the effort to you know upgrading your place, keeping it you know the the always swept things organized and and taken care of it doesn't have to be high dollar mm. it just needs to be taken care of like you care that's it you know and if you they see you doing that with your stuff they're gonna see they're gonna expect that they're they're gonna they're gonna think that they're gonna see the same thing in their in your work right and when they see that it makes a big difference that's it and and to be to be realistic most most of these horse things don't pay the bills. Not very many people out there making money mm. off of owning their horses. Mm. So these are, you know, these are their investments that they trust and trust us to manage and mm-hmm. hold and take care of. And if we don't take care of our own stuff and, you know, keep ourselves in a certain manner, they're not, they don't want to entrust you with their no. assets either. Yep. No, you know, exactly. Who are you going to, you know, who are you going to hand a briefcase full of money to? Yeah, you know, stereotypes, you know, whatever, you know, just be presentable everywhere you go, and you know, yeah. speak well with people. Yeah, you know, they don't want to hear, you know, <laughs> your clients don't want to hear your political views. They don't want to hear your. They don't, do. see, they don't want to hear you. But they don't Whether hear they you. like it or not, they're getting it. Yeah, but you know, like it's just, <laughs> I, I just find that there's, st- you know. 
these, you know, if you, if you get the opportunity to work for people with good resources, they there's a way to behave around them, you know, yeah. to yeah. make yourself, you know, you, I like to think, you know, I want to make it so that person, if that guy came home with my daughter, I wouldn't be upset. Yeah. Even Never. though he's a laborer. Yeah. He shoes horses for a living. Yeah. You know, I'd like to change the perspective of, you know, strong back and weak mind. Mm-hmm. You know, Boy. That's, that's always what it was. Yeah. You know, I think there's, I think it's the time to change it, you know. People I think are so. paying more for horses. People are doing more, you know. Mm-hmm. Everything is, you know, the opportunity to do well for ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, I want to think about, like, I want to shoot horses till I'm 60. Mm-hmm. I'd like to have some resources myself at 60 mm-hmm. so that I can yeah. go do something. So I can go shoot sporting clays for the day instead of shooting, shooting horses or whatever. And don't get me wrong, I, I love being a horseshoer. Mm-hmm. It's not every day I like shooting horses. Yeah. But I love being yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know? The yeah. Freedom, very true. The freedom, the everything about it. Yeah. It's cool to me. So do you attribute like your attitude there about sort of changing the perspective and how professional your operation was? Did, was that a really early influence? Was that someone you were around really early? Cause, yeah. Because uh, I, I know like when I first got interested in it in Australia, I, uh, I reached out to a guy that I knew he was a farrier and he wasn't that much older than me. And uh, I was lucky he let me come and, you know, start riding with him and learning some. And and I could have ended up with anyone, but this guy was super professional, like exactly all the things you said. And the good thing for me was like, they say first impressions count. And to me, that was like, well, that's a fact. That's what I, if it's not that, uh, that's, it's like not what I want, you know? And, uh, I was like, I considered that I was lucky in that sense. And it sounds like, did you have some, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, you something know, like, like that? Rick Garrison, he was the president of the Texas professional farriers association the year that I, the year that I helped him. And he was that way, you know, mm-hmm. it's all professional. It's by the book. It's, we make our appointments. We keep our appointments. We do, you know, let's elevate this trade, you know, yeah, because mm-hmm. it's, it was so common, you know, to see people that, you know, jump out of the truck and beer cans fall out of the truck <laughs> and a Jack Russell jumps out and kills your barn cat. Like, that's uncool. Yeah. And that, you know, like, that's not the image that we want to promote. Yeah. And, you know, and I look at it, you know, you look at it, I think people kind of go, well, you know, this is the image of horseshoers and this is where we're at. Well, nobody's going to change it if you don't. Yep. Yeah. You know? that's, that's... And if I start changing it, then if if I change the way I do it and then I get two or three young guys that come up and say, hey, I want to ride with you, then all of a sudden, maybe I change them. Yeah. And I change those three guys and those three guys change three guys. Yeah. And then the trajectory of this deal changes. Man. And then if we get enough of us doing it good, then the other guys are going to look at it and go, oh, man, I can't compete. I'm not, you know, mm-hmm. not that they can't compete, but... They'll yeah. go, wow. It raises the, the bar. Successful people are doing like this. Yeah. 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 Let's do like this. And, right. yeah. and that's the way you do it in an area. You come into an area and, and try to improve it, not drag it down. That's super cool. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah, I've thought about I, I I used to explain that whenever I would when I wanted to train when I decided I was gonna train horses, I, I decided that um I had to understand like there was a you know, I wanted to ride really nice horses and I couldn't afford the really nice horses. Sure. So I had to, I had to learn how to get people to buy those really nice horses. And, um, and I equated the like training horses and what I wanted to do with my business as like a jeweler. So I could make, I could make rings. And if I made rings that went in the bubble gum machine, I got to make a whole bunch of those rings. If I made rings and, you know, there's some nice rings like James Avery or, you know, those kind of quality rings and they're nice rings and they're not cheap, but I have to sell a lot of those to make what I want to make in a month. And so then I'm, I'm still nice, but it's, it's, I see a lot more of a quantity than necessarily the quality. And there still makes a good living in some of those. Right. But then there was another group of people that had, rings that they spent a lot more money on and those people saw quality 
that I didn't see at the time. Mm. But whenever I started to see what they wanted, which was that quality, then I had to, the, if I could figure out what that quality was, I could make one ring a month and live off of the, the profit. It's the same material. It costs the same amount of money for the material, but it was the quality that I put into it. And there's a certain group of people that see that quality. And so I had to know, I had to educate myself as to what the quality was. And then I had to put that time and work into it. And I could make more money, not necessarily working less hard, but just in a different way and and working towards a higher quality. That's what I wanted. And so that's the kind of horse that I wanted to build was the one that was worth it and had that value. But um, there's a certain group of people that see that value. And I have to know what they value. Yeah, that's it. And I, I think shoeing horses, guys get caught up in the sometimes, and they say, "Oh well, you know, if I would have known this horse was going to go." We see it at the vet hospital. A horse comes in with a shoeing job on, and we have to evaluate it. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, the fair might come along with the client. You know, mm-hmm. struggling getting this horse right. You know, I'm going to come up see what the guys at Rig Riddle have to say. Right. And we have to be diplomatic, but honest. Yeah. And say, you know, well, this really isn't up to the mark. This work. And you'd often hear guys who are who are quality farriers would say, oh, well, if I would have known he was coming up here, I would have done something different. You don't know where they're going to go. Yeah. You don't know. So you have to do each one as, like, this is my brand. This is my stamp. I'm putting on this mm-hmm. one. And I'm sending him away, and he could go anywhere. Yeah. And he could go. He might go shoot. He might go to a vet hospital where one of my buddies works. My buddies are gonna pat me on the back and then call me and go, "Man, that sucked, but I covered you." No, that's not the way mm. forward. Yeah. You send it as good as you can. Yeah. And people say, you know, I've been lucky enough to get to shoot horses that went to Wellington, Florida, and and jump down there and stuff. And those guys are incredibly good farriers down there. And but like you, you say, I want to shoot horses like that. Well, start here. Start shooting them right here yeah. that way. You don't yeah. have to go don't there to do it. Don't wait to go down to Florida to start shooing horses well yeah. and making a nice job of it and caring what it looks like. And, you know, like that's all. Every one of them is there to practice on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, like I see horses walk up. What I like to do with my horses when I walk up to them is I look at them. And I evaluate them when I walk up and go, all right, why did this change this way? Why does it not look the way I thought it would? You know, what do I need to do? I've got to do something better here, you know. And I think, guys, get, we get caught up in the, you know, we got to get these done. we got to get these done. we got to pop these shoes off, shorten this foot, get the shoe back on. But we have to look at them and say, what, is, what can I improve? If you don't look at everything and say, what can I improve today on this job? Mm-hmm. Then we're not going to grow. We're not going to get any better. Mm-mm. You know, and like... It's very, it's very easy when we stay in one spot, you know, without outside influences, other guys evaluating. That was yeah. the great thing about working there at the vet hospital is this, it's this hive of great minds, you know, all these guys, you know, looking at your work, you know, and every day you're showing horses in front of other people that yeah. know what's up. Yeah. Yeah. That's gotta be hard. And, I get know, know, that. I mean, that's seriously, that's, that's a, that's the same thing as a show pin, right? It's one thing to be out here riding and thinking I'm the best thing since sliced yeah. bread in my backyard. But whenever I go to the competition and go to the pen and I got a judge uh, standing in front of me that's that's critiquing what I'm doing, that's what a judge is, is he's judging your work, right? And I'm like, man, that's, that would be, you know, I can't imagine being at that level with that kind of, that level of pressure with one running at mm. that many big, big yeah. races. And that was, you know, that was always the thing, you know, I shared with you a story of the horse Camelot that was, that ran in the, the almost won the Irish Triple Crown in 2012. And, you know, there was a lot of pressure, a lot of hype around that horse and a lot, you know, about shooing him, you know, and, uh, you know, Aiden said, you know, just, you know, what's your plan? And I said, I'm just going to do it like we always do mm-hmm. it, you know, just going to shoot him when we're supposed to shoot him. And we try to shoot him four days out from a run. Mm-hmm. You know, horses do their last piece of fast work four days, four days before their race, the mm-hmm. big group one races. Yeah. And uh, so we show them after that and let it roll. Yeah. Don't think about it. 
it's not, you know, you just do, you know, if you're doing them right, if you're doing their best every day, on the big days, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because you're just doing it. You're just doing the job. Yeah. And, and everybody, you'd hear people, people would walk up to you and say, don't drive a hot nail in Camelot. Suck it, get... suck it, pal. Yeah. yeah. You know, or do a good job, you know. And oh, people, damn. I was, I was, I was yeah. planning on doing that. No. <laughs> well, and people, people say, oh, well, you know, do a good job on this horse. They paid this much money for him. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I was going to yeah. do the best job I did on him. Yeah. I didn't care if you got him, if you rescued him from the Mustang deal. Mm-hmm. I don't, yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter to me. Yeah. It doesn't, it shouldn't matter to us. Right. Yeah. We just do the best we can every day on him. And yeah. then everything else falls into place. Yeah. That's, that's something we've talked about. Hey, Todd is like how you could be doing a good job outside of say competition in whatever realm you're in. And then right up before, like you said, four days out as a farrier or going into the show pan or whatever. You, 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 if you're inexperienced, you might try and like overthink it, uh, and it's like change what you do. Yeah, don't change. The worst change. thing you can yeah. do mm-hmm. is right before the big race, you think, you know what I'm gonna do this time? I'm gonna leave him a little extra foot because yeah. I want to make sure I don't cripple him. I yeah. want to make sure that he goes good. So you leave him a little bit long, and then you don't get your nails as good as you should have. And your nails, maybe you used a couple old nail holes, and maybe that wall is a little brittle there. And then he shoot, throws a shoe in the race because mm. you didn't nail him up good. Yeah, because you were scared to nail him up good. Yeah, grow some stones. Yeah, <laughs> nail him up good every day. Yeah, well, and you know? something that I say to to even my non pros and stuff too is like, um, it's nothing about this is not scientific. I'm like, what you should be doing in any kind of scientific research, right? Was the same thing that you would do in here. You start with a known, and you 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 limit your variables. You only change one small thing here or there to see if there's something you can improve or make better. You go and throw everything out and throw everything back in. You got no idea. So if I say, if I'm going to prepare my horse, I'm riding him this way and I've got him all the way up to day before the day of the, the competition. And I and I get in there in a warm up pen and I'm thinking, you know, I'm watching somebody else and I'm doing, and I start doing something different or riding harder, or I'm pushing harder or whatever else. And let's say I go in there and I do good. Even if I did good, I didn't know what made it good. Was it all the work that I put in the month before? Or was it that little two days mm-hmm. beforehand that I whacked things around? Now I've got to recreate this this variable you know, mm-hmm. in it. Instead, if I'd stayed with it and stuck with my whole deal, and even if I didn't win, at least I could go back. I had a constant to go back and pluck one thing out and go back mm-hmm. and scientifically change one thing and test it again. Mm-hmm. But whenever I have everything changed in the midstream, I don't know which one even, even if it does, I don't know which one worked. Mm-hmm. I'm still, the next show, I'm still at ground zero to not knowing how to recreate that same thing again because I had inconsistencies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one thing I say and I learned a long time ago, is the enemy of good is better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything's we going totally good. We're doing good. We're doing good. You know, we're getting there in a slow and steady manner. Mm. But man, if we made it a little better, if we push a little harder, we do a little. Yeah. We yeah. go. You, we walk the line between fit and failure and yeah. racehorses and everything in life. You know. Yeah. yeah. And like all of a sudden, we just you know, I think I can improve this. And yeah. sometimes mm, Just that little yeah. push. You know, I want to do this a little bit, a little more, a little yeah. more of this, you know, and the wheels fall off. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. And that would have been like no more, uh, that would have been so evident in what you were doing in Ireland mm-hmm. where it's like, it's a fine line at that, at that level sure. between like something being good and pushing it a little too far. Like, yeah. and, yeah. and the repercussions are pretty big. Massive, <laughs> massive you know? Yeah, if there's it's the pressure, the stakes are high, the pressure's high, you know. Yeah, like and but just having the confidence and knowing, you know, you you do the you do the ordinary things extraordinarily well. Yeah, Boy, basics are, good. basics are everything, you know. Mm. Doing Flat. ordinary things extraordinary well. That's that's that's, that's, that's where it's at, you know. That's, it really is, and that's all it is. If you break it down, extraordinary. So, so, so just sorry to interrupt. I just thought while we're on that train of thought, like of the just the ordinary things, like when you were over there, and it sounds like your schedule was pretty full, and 
And sure. uh, well, as far as like continuing education, you know, like were you were you or were you just too busy at that it point? Was, to... It was very hard over there because you're, you know, you have a, a really serious schedule, you know, and it's hard to get, you know, if there's a clinic somewhere, it's hard to get to it because those things often happen during the racing season. Yeah. You can't be gone, you know, you just can't be gone some of those times. So, you know, continuing education was hard. Luckily, there's some great Facebook groups that, uh, hmm. you know, four farriers that I've been lucky enough to be involved in. Yeah. And I've, uh, you know, I've swung a pretty big rope in my career and I know a lot of guys and, you know, I can, I always send pictures to my, you know, some of these guys and what would you do with this or what's going on here, you know, bounce hmm. ideas off of people you know other guys I have a friend down in Corpus Christi Virgil Condi and we talk nearly every day you know what's this horse got you know what you know you bounce it off of each other if you can't go learn something from somebody else you mm-hmm. know you try to talk to guys and you know continuing education is massive I, I I can't can't encourage it enough in mm-hmm. young guys you know that's where you meet all the people you need to you know is going to the conventions and different mm-hmm. clinics and stuff and you because you it's very easy to get real complacent in our little area here mm. or where yeah you know? it is and like and oftentimes you know clinicians or different people be brought in for us to learn and they focus on one thing you know but you got to get out of your comfort zone because like it's just like working out and doing jujitsu or mm. crossfit or any of these things we tend to kind of do the things that we're good at yeah because they don't suck as bad. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, that's why everybody goes around with big arms and chests and little bitty legs. Because yeah. squats and lunges suck. You know? Yeah. So we don't do them. But, like, but, you know, like, I think, I think shoeing horses too. Like, say we're good at building horseshoes. That's great. You know, we get really good at that. But is that really, it's, it's better for us to go to some guy that's shooing big time show horses somewhere. Mm making keeping keeping those old good horses sound yep. mm. there's an art in that yes. yeah there is yeah go pick his brain he's not the guy that you see all the time mm. you know you see a, there's so many really top level horseshoes that no one ever knows about because they're you know because they're working yeah yeah they're just at a show barn working and they're supporting their families and they're doing well and and those are the guys that I admire and want to you know Find guys that can keep an old campaigner sound for a long time, and that's where those are the tough ones, man. That's the that's the art of it, because like these racehorses and stuff, we're working on when they're two and three and four. Yeah, and there's don't get me wrong, there's a lot can go wrong, but it's usually acute injuries. Mm -hmm. You know, a horse has a quarter crack, he's got an abscess, he's got a, a bruised heel, something happened to him. You know, those kind of things, they require some attention and some special shoeing to get them through it, but that's not a long-term career ending thing where jumping four or five foot fences mm-hmm. into their teens is a long yeah, term. That's, that's a lot of strain, a lot of stress, lot. and mm-hmm. there's a lot more to shoeing that horse than there is to shoeing a racehorse. Mm-hmm. And I always said, you know, I have a philosophy shoeing, shoeing different horses is they're all, they're all just horses and they're all built the same. The anatomy of a racehorse is not any different than the anatomy of your reiner. Mm-hmm. So he shouldn't do his confirmation and what suits him. And I I shot racehorses like I shoot sport horses. Mm-hmm. If a horse needed a bigger, wider shoe, he got it. I wasn't, I wasn't, I got out of the box of, well, he's a racehorse, you can't give him any shoe. Yeah. No, that's bull crap. Yeah. You know? Okay. He's, he, they got what they needed. Yeah. And that's, I think that's why we had some success that we had mm. when I was there is if a horse needed a bar shoe, he got a bar shoe. Okay. Simple as, you know, that's what he needed. So that's what he got. And a couple of days before the race, I pop his bar shoe off and put a regular shoe on him and let him run. Yep. Comes back, gets the bar shoes back on. Yeah. Off we go, you know, hmm. but so many folks don't want to do that. Don't want to do the extra work, the extra step. It's yep. a pain in the butt. Yeah. No, yep. no doubt about it. To do it that way is hard. But most things that are worth the dang are hard, too. Yeah, mm. that's cool. You yeah. know, yeah. you shoot them like Boy, they need to be. Uh, man. Treat them like they need to be treated. Like, don't yeah. just, don't 
don't just pigeonhole different horses into certain things because oh, it's not he didn't pick to be a racehorse. Yeah, that's not they they do tend to want to run, but yeah, like but it's not his fault, you know. Like I can't just say oh he can't have that kind of shoe because he's a racehorse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man, that's... he gets what he needs, and that's where that's where you get successful. I think you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm not successful on every one. I learn on every one of them, you know. Yeah, I, I screwed up so many horses up. Over the years, I'm sure you know, but uh, I've probably is it a stupid them. computer one. Yeah, that but, was, yeah, that it's amazing the parallels in like elite level anything, isn't you know, true? like farriery, like horse training, or any other sport. It's just like doing the simple things exceptionally well. And, uh, you know, all these little things that you're saying, putting in that extra little 1% that other people aren't willing to do. And and, and you know what? I, I listened to Todd's talks about marriage the other day, stuff mm. like that. It's the same there. Yeah. Because you put in the time there, you know, and that's important too. Mm-hmm. Oh boy. You know, it, I mean, if you neglect that, then the rest of your everything else it goes to yeah. poo too. You know, yeah. that's it. You know, yeah. I, I I talked to my sister this morning, and you know, we were we were front row seats to the greatest love story of all time. My parents, mm. you know, yeah. and so it's really you know to see the you know fifty one years of marriage in there. Mm. You know mm. what they put into it. Mm. Oh my god! And just think about how many kids don't get to see that. Like that's, that's heartbreaking. And you know that's that is a that's a massive win for my kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that I got to witness that. Yeah, yeah. Because invariably, whatever you know, crappy tendencies I have, you know, yeah. like just being exposed to that and seeing my dad treat my mother. Yeah. I'm probably gonna treat my my wife a lot more like my dad treats yeah my mom mm-hmm. you know yeah. and then my daughter gets to see the way I treat her mom yeah and she knows how she's to be treated boy but there's not a not not a greater example it really is not I mean that's so beneficial for your daughters to see that that's yeah. it and my son mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, that exactly. To learn. Brendan just started his just, um, love journey. story. Oh. Journey fairly recently. Yeah, well done. <laughs> Thank well done. you. Yeah, you got married. You. Yep, got married, and uh, yeah, I'm the I the same as you. Like I I am so blessed to have witnessed like what I did with my parents. You know, and I think about it uh, often. You know, when you're younger, you just kind of think that's it and then uh, the more the more the years go by and I see more and more in the world I realize like it was I was just so lucky and blessed to to be around that because Mm -hmm. yeah like man it's it's special putting in 100% that's it you know I wonder how much that comes into play on like so for all three of us um that like, I'm trying to figure out how to say that well, but that even in my parents' marriage, failure wasn't an option. Like, it, mm. it out out wasn't an option, right? So whenever I went to go to work and do something, like, quitting wasn't necessarily an option. That wasn't, I never, something no. that never crossed my mind. Mm. You know, that I didn't look, I was, I was never looking for a way out. Mm-mm. Whenever I went, stepped into something, I, I didn't, and I didn't look at it thinking that it was never a hard deal, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, or that that, um, you know, my mom and dad, my mom and dad are still married and still together, and I'm like, it, well, I think it's over like fifty something years now, mm-hmm. and they, um, um, they still, it, it's nothing funnier than watching seventies mid seventies oh. arguing and, <laughs> and but it's but they never they never um even argued like that's it and it's over. It was just mm. it was just, you know, my kids are sitting back like, did you see her the <laughs> and grandpa said that to <laughs> to Mimi or something, but you know, that it's kind of, you know, it's funny, but there was never a, you know, like well, that's it, he's gone. Or that mm, there was sure. a quit to it. And so you and like that's never been an option for me on my work or um or in my marriage either that um 
I mean, I'm not, I'm not quitting that either. No. No, she's no, stuck. She's, stuck. <laughs> <laughs> she's got that poor woman's got to put up with me for the rest yeah. of this thing. You understand the long suffering wife term, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, it, isn't it great because they there's not very many successful guys that don't have a successful woman behind them. Mm-hmm. It's not, and you know, you wonder how like how many you see of that that aren't successful in in steady jobs and steady business and and everything else too. Like I don't. Huh, I've never made that correlation before, but that's yeah. true. And and that you know, like you and and going in and realizing, and like it wasn't anything that you thought. Like, oh, that's it. I'm done, and I'm not going to fight anymore because I can't get this. Or mm. like, that's not something that goes through your head. Yeah, you know, that's not something. Quitting was never something that I thought that I was going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. No. And and like, I'm sure you guys are the same as me. You marry way over your head. And I oh just, yeah. But it's it, it to me. It, it's kind of like you marry over your head, and then you try to keep up with them. Yeah, yeah. It always keep you a bit sharp, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like I, my wife's incredible. You know, the smartest. Uh, I can't say. I, I won't say a bunch about her because she's be mad <laughs> here. But you know, but but it's just like competing with with other trainers, other mm. fighters, you know pick a mark that's out there a little further than you think you can reach. Yeah. Yeah. And then you'll always, you know, one of the, one of the doctors there at the hospital always said, he said, you know, we're going to aim for perfection and knowing we're not going to get there, but we're going to hit excellent along the way. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's true. So, but like, you know, the, yeah, having the, having the support system of the strong wife. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And those days where like, I think to be successful in like what we've done, you have to be self-driven and strong anyway, but there's always those days where you might have a bit of self-doubt or whatever. And then that, that have such a, uh, like a strong wife to, to be like, you got it. It's all good. And, and, and not even have to say it, but they're out the front leading by their actions. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. you just keep up. I think yeah. that's it's pretty special. It's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. You know, yeah. when we decided, when we decided to leave Ireland, we didn't, we never knew how long we were going to stay. We, it was open ended and we, you know, we went over there. We we're going to give it two years, and then mm. we're there for five years, and then we're there for seven years, and you know, and things just all these things happen in a way that you just feel like the time is right. You know, mm. you know, my parents are older, and I think the greatest gift we can give back to our parents for not killing us when we were little <laughs> is to let them be around their grandkids. Yeah. You know? And you know, oh, I should have been drowned several times. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, you know, and but. You know, the world used to be a smaller place before COVID and all that carry mm-hmm. on. You know, I could always get on an airplane and come home, mm-hmm. fly home, see my family. You know, and we'd fly home every Christmas and sit, you know, with the kids, and then all that changed a bit. And you know, and then my parents got my dad got COVID, and his health's a wreck, anyways. And it's just like, you know what? Let's just go home. Mm-hmm. Let's go home. We've done well here. Let's go home and be near our family. You know, yeah. get those kids. We've seen our parents more this year than we have in the past seven years. And in that, I mean, it really is something that you give to your parents, giving back. That's all by, you can give them. And, and it's, man, it gives to your kids, too. That's it. Right? The memories they'll have of their grandparents. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. It's irreplaceable. Process. Yeah, it really is. And it, it it's such a increase in their quality of life, too, getting to be around it. And it's, mm. it's feel, it, it, you know, it's, I've met, I've listened to my dad tell me more things about what he remembers growing up and all that kind of stuff. Like he gets to reminisce on so many things, getting to see my kids playing sports and doing those mm. things. And, you know, it's it gives them, you know, even, you know, not that they don't have purpose without my kids, but they it gives them even more. So to be a participant in it, see some of their lineage going on and, mm. and you know, and, and a purpose in, in going and being. I mean, it just... It adds, it adds to the life. life. To yeah. Mm. It adds life to them. My parents live with my sister. She has two small kids, and I know that's has it's a massive thing keeping my dad going. Yeah. You know, his granddaughter comes up and chats to him every day and yeah. reads with him. You know, all that stuff. My, it's priceless. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It really is. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. My dad saying, like, so you think I should talk to him about, about this? I'm like, well, I mean, I... I, I did. And then at first I was like, you know, you, you, you don't need to. And I was like, ah, 
yeah, why don't you go ahead and have the conversation with him? Torture my son. He needs to talk about it again. <laughs> but it's, it is funny that, um, man, you just never know when that, what something said or you know mm-hmm. comes in from someplace else that I know I I gotta say it fifty times before somebody really hears it mm-hmm. too you know that's it that's yeah. it and people hear you know you you hear something from someone else makes a different impact than hearing it from your dad mm-hmm. it's true you know there's there's a great one of one of the better horseshoers around a guy named Austin Edens and I remember when I was starting out his dad used to send him up to Rick Harrison and a fellow named Tad Pig up. So they could they could work with him because the dynamic of working with your dad is too hard sometimes, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, it's good to get out of that, you know, hear from somebody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a lot more. I think that's why I like doing these, really. Yeah. Because, when, you know, um, I find, I, I, he, I see Matthew, you know, listening in on my conversations and stuff and, and me hearing, you know, like, I, I look at him and say, like, man, dude, I've said that to you 50 million times. And he's like, yeah, but, you know, Jeff said this, <laughs> you know. And, uh, Brendan was over here and he told me, you know, like, I'm, dude, I've been saying that, like, all this time, you know. And but it's the same thing, right? Yeah. And, um, man, it's, I think that's when we look at it, like, it takes a village. But yeah. that's the village that not just, you know, not a government village. Sure. But it takes a, 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 it's, I, I think that we play a big role, a so much more of a bigger role than what we think we really do when we're out and, um, and I see, and I have someone like Brendan who, you know, is a, is, is a good role model to my kids. Right. And that, you know, and they get to have an interaction and a fun and a, and a talking to with them stuff that, you know, it's just re- that we're all on the same page, right? Mm-hmm. That I know my kids have got to work through hard things and I know that they're going to go, go through struggles and go, you know, whatever it is. But I have a, a network of people that are like-minded in what they're doing and they realize that my kids are going to struggle no matter what. And that we're all here to kind of like go and reiterate the same things like, hey, dude, step up. You got to work through it or, yeah. you know, but they see that in, in, in a community. Sure. And um, in that community... Like here's your 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 dad and your and your mom and you know the things that are around you. So the people that you interact with, you know, it's just like if you surround yourself by five millionaires, you'll be the sixth one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. If you surround yourself by five drunks, you're gonna be the sixth one too. Yeah, you know? yeah, you know? yeah. And that's it's very it, true. You just don't know as you're going through life the all the different turning points and the whys and the road and the different people that you meet. That make an impact and change your trajectory that's crazy because now i can look back and think about some of these different people that had an impact and changed the trajectory yeah for me mm-hmm. you know and i think it's important to try to be available to those folks to change you know because mm-hmm. you don't and, and people people i know that changed my trajectory don't know that they did it i yeah. know right they don't have a clue that they had you know that I was at a crossroads. Yeah, yeah. When I met them, and they they helped me get where I, where I needed to go. You know. Mm. Yeah, that's why you. I think that's why it's such an important character, such a good thing. Yeah. And like you know that you have you know that you have a good character, but you're also that you're available to share that character, mm. right? And be strong enough in your character to not. I think right now the thing that I worry about with my kids is that I I see um, a lot of um, a lot of bending and waning to the times of you know well but you know we don't have to look at things that way or or you know that's that's. Um, it's that's your deal or it does that's not but there's no hardline truth to reality right that you know that guy's just lucky or feeding that narrative kind mm-hmm. of deal that you know we all should we're all good enough to be able to be like that we should all get to have that mm-hmm. and you know that's not true yeah, no. right yeah. i mean the reality is is that you work hard yeah and nobody falls back into it and you think that that guy's just luckily be- got it 
Yeah. Well, maybe he did, but wait till it's going to turn out later on, because then yeah. it can be also lucky later. Yeah, you know? exactly. I was thinking that before when Jeff was saying about uh, just the little one percent things like wearing a collared shirt, get keeping your truck clean, doing the best job on every single horse you can, and and you there'd be some young guys in the shoeing game that might hear of his job in Ireland and be like, oh man, he's lucky to get that. And it's like, that wasn't lucky. That If he didn't do any of those 1% things, he probably didn't get that job. No, and it and it, and it, it wasn't lucky that the guys that he followed yeah. just did that either, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, like, they didn't it. just, I mean, you they led by example. They didn't sit there and, that guy didn't tell you, you know, hey, this is how you run a business. And then yeah. meanwhile, he, you know, kicks beer cans on the way out of his truck, you know, or that yeah, exactly. he, you know, didn't keep a calendar or, you know, write things down. Like they, they lead by example, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, um, and, and, and then, you know, shared it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, we, we're all, we're all a bit of a wealth of information. It's, but, but in the same sense, you know, guys that want to get in the game need to come they need to come seek those folks out. Mm. And because I'm not just going to say, you know, see some kid and go, hey, man, why don't you come along with me and I'll make you into something. That's yeah. not the way this deal works. No. It's yeah. not how it worked for me. No. They need to come get in the truck and come up a bit, you know, and happy to help anybody, you know, show the initiative. I had a kid in Ireland. That, so I had a guy that hold horses for me all day long, every day, rode around the truck with me in the van. And he said, oh, I want to get a shoe and apprenticeship. He never offered to take the shoe and box out of the truck. He never offered to do any, you know. Hmm. And I thought, well, I'm probably in a position where I could have helped you get an apprenticeship or got hmm. you help in getting into the school. But there was no, you know, they got to show. Some incentive. Show incentive. You know? Yeah. And if I, even to this day, I, I'm happy to go get in anybody's truck, go shoe horses with them for the day. And if I'm not going to be shoeing horses with them, I'm going to be standing there with a broom mm. and be cleaning up around, you know, making sure the area that we work in is tidy and clean. Yeah. If, you know, like still that, you know, if you have time to lean, you have time to clean mentality. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. You know, like that's what, that's what we got to get back in some of the, the people coming up in, in all trades, you know, yeah. no more victim BS. Yeah. You know, but nope. it's just it's you only you only get what you make out of it. You get That's one it. chance at this world. That's right. Don't live regrets. Don't don't say, Oh well, what would I you know, what would have happened? Bull crap, you know. Mm. Be be in charge, drive your own, you know, paddle your boat. Yeah, yep. it's been a really big thing for me here lately is I've seen like so my youngest son, um my older son, he's he's kind of getting motivated. He's like seeing things and wanting to, and uh, and George is a little slower on on doing that kind of stuff. And and so I've kind of like I'm always like you know, hey man, and like step up and do this, and hey you know you need to do that, and hey you need to. And then I the other day, God, what a freaking beer in my own side, right? But I uh, I'm sitting there and I'm going, you know, like. And you, you could, you could at least do, and then I'm going, God, I'm not doing it. Like I sat there and looked at it and gone, you know, like when he's around me and he's not like, I'm not being enough of that example. Yeah. Right. Oh man. That was a, that was a tough one to swallow. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's... And, and, you know, I wasn't, I was expecting, or was making him take the initiative to ask me to go and do and spend time. And it was like, God, man. So how does he know to do that? Unless I'm going and doing it. Yeah. You know, and I, I've fallen, you know, but acknowledging that mm. stepping back into it and going, okay, so how do I lead? I lead by example. Mm-hmm. So I started showing him how to do it. And God, oh, man, we had a great weekend last weekend. Yeah. You know, got to go out and got to got to go hunt and you know, and he and you know, got to, you know, do some stuff together and really spend some quality time because I asked. Mm. Like like a like such a big dummy. You know, sat there all this time going, what was, what was you, this is how you do it. And I was telling him how to do it, but I wasn't doing it myself, right? Yeah. God, what a big dummy I can be sometimes, you know, but. It's hard to follow in the footsteps if nobody's making them. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah, that got me. Yeah. Yeah, that got me. 
But half of that, I think, is what has gotten me good, or at least better than the average, right? Is that it was the same thing with the Futurity this last year, that or this year, is that, you know, had a crap run. I could have wallered in it, but I didn't. I stepped back and went, well, all right, well, I know how to go back about getting back at it. Mm -hmm. What do I want to do? Do I want to go there or not? Okay, well, I don't want to sit back here. That's you know, it. I want to go back and get back in it again. So, you know, and... You know, do I need to? I don't need to. I don't have mm -hmm. to. I don't have anything to prove about it or whatever else. But I have the desire to get better at it again. Like, I don't want to stop now. This is what makes me, you know, it's it stimulates my brain. And it, not only that, but it's an example for my kids. Like, I want to, like, how are they going to know how to get up and step up and work harder mm -hmm. and stuff? It's got to be me. That's it. That's it. You can't look, can't look where we've been. You just look where we're going. Exactly. That's why that, you know, I look back, you know, four or five months ago and I'm like, God. I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> you look back at two, three years, four, five years ago, and you're like, man, yeah. I'm a long ways from where I was then. Yeah, yeah no. Hmm. This is good. Good. That's inspiring. Yeah. That's good stuff, man. man. I like hearing that. You know, it's it's yeah. that's the responsibility of, you know, honestly, Jeff, that's the responsibility of men our age. It is, is. to, you know, invest back into the younger guys and, and then we have a rarity like Brendan here who's like beyond age is wise beyond his years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, you know, I hope some young guys will pick it up and, and go with it and make it better than we did. You know, that's, that's the real goal. Yeah. You just, it, it's, it's all in their hands to make it better than we made it. Yeah, that is true. I mean, they, they you just got to realize that that's, it's at your fingertips. And there's so many they there's so many different advantages that people have now with you know, technology is is great, but it's bad. It's you know yeah. you can you can get the information you can get so much information about chewing horses now that wasn't there fifteen years ago that mm. I just read the book. Yeah. You know, drive down the road with the guy I work for, asking him questions about, you know, trying to practice for a certification or, you know, pick his brain well. You know, now I can just look at it on my phone and find those answers myself if mm -hmm. I wanted, you know. Yeah. There's no reason we can't learn piles about it, you know. Yeah. But that had. that book you don't see the work. That's it. That's mm. that you don't you don't you don't the book doesn't tell you the attitude. The no. book doesn't tell you the work ethic. No. It only gets you ready to go to work. Exactly. You give it in your mind, but it's the it's the strong back and the strong mind. <laughs> That's it. That's right. That's it. And, you know, keeping, you know, young guys showing horses, they got to keep fit. You got to stay, stay active. You know, mm -hmm. it's very easy to, you know, get ourselves out of shape. And, you know, I found the, you know, I'd say I found the Fountain of Youth working out probably 12 years ago with yeah. some guys at the vet clinic. You know, my back was starting to hurt. And, yeah. Dr. Bross was going down to the gym every morning and working out so I got in there and started going with him pretty soon I wasn't going to see chiropractors anymore or massages all the time Yeah, I was just working out and one day I said man I feel good and I can show a lot of horses now Yeah, and I just kept it up and I kept a personal trainer when I was in Ireland yeah, that's worked, for, worked with a guy named Colin Rolls who's amazing and uh, you know he owned a CrossFit gym and he kept me fit and working out and you know, since I've been back, I haven't been as diligent, and my back will kind of go out on me. Mm. But I'll start doing pull-ups again and getting, you know, swinging the kettlebell and doing the stuff that I need to do. And it fixes. Yeah. We can fix ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and stay, but, you know, if we don't stay strong and supple. Boy, there's something that the whole like, adage of you, you, know, you, you don't use it, you lose it. Boy, yeah. That really kind of screams at you when you hit 50. Yeah. yeah. Really yeah. screams at you. Yeah, you can't just go on youth anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit more maintenance. Oh, well, really good. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. I sure do appreciate it, man. It was I appreciate very it. informative. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Was that. Real cool. I learned a lot. I'm very inspired. I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, thank you all and, uh, for the opportunity and I hope it's useful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if anybody needs to get a hold of you, to learn more young man out there wanting to kind of jump in the truck and learn something or wanting to, uh, you, can, you know, you can send me a message on Facebook. I'm, you know, that's probably the, I'm not going to give out my telephone number really to folks. 
things. Yeah, no. You know, I, I've, yeah, you know. If, if Gotta work for it. If somebody wanted to come along, you know, reach out and, you know, see what we can do. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's the deal is, you know, for young guys is join your fairy associations and get involved in it. But that's where they find guys like you, right? That's it. Your own local farrier, farrier association. That's These it. are guys that are dil- diligently working to, towards getting better. That's it. That's just groups of guys getting together learning. Mm-hmm. Cool. Very cool. Well, there you go. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. You bet. Yeah.